You're listening to the Youth Creek Podcast on KHZ Network. Find us on Facebook at Decibel UNG Radio and find us on Twitter at Decibel UNG. If you like this episode, please leave a like and comment on our iTunes page at KHZ Network. And now for the podcast. Should you choose to accept it? I wonder, did you ever choose not to? The end you always feared is coming. And the blood will be on your hands. The fallout of all your good intentions. You had a terrible choice to make in Berlin. One life over millions. And now the world is at risk. This is the CIA's mission. If he had held on to the plutonium, we wouldn't be having this conversation. His team would be dead. Yes, they would. That's the job. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Youth Critic Podcast. I am your host, Kale Smith. Joining me today is... Good. And today we are going to be talking about Mission Impossible Fallout, the action movie of the summer. What were, what are your thoughts on the original, like the uh, the previous five movies? Um, I remember when I was a uh, when I was younger, and the first uh, Mission Impossible came out, didn't think really much of it. Like, thought it like the obviously the. High sets uh, headquarters, CIA headquarters stands out. O- always has, always will, because you know uh, that's been parried, parodied to death and then back uh, with everybody trying to like you know, or and you can't touch the floor, all that kind of stuff. Um, so that was kind of a game changer right there. And as I rewatched all of the films this past uh, this last month leading up to Fallout, I realized how much more. I really enjoy the entire series. Maybe it's because of like, since about 2008, like Tom Cruise has just been on fire. I don't know. But like during his time when I didn't really care for his movies, like these ones were the ones that stood, stood, that stood out to, uh, from his other stuff to actually be pretty good, I think. Um, so he, it just stayed constant. Like number two kind of dips because it's more about be trying to be, a John Woo slash Michael Bay type, that kind of action film, which Mm -hmm. is not the type of action film that the series wants to be. But, you know, at the time, you know, it was 2000. It was the hip thing to do. So that's why they did it. And um, obviously being a box office hound that I am, I looked and it is pretty crazy how much of a drop off it was between the box office drop off was between two and three, because Three is a significantly better film. You know, the it's a crazy, it's a really good burn thriller, you know, action thriller. Uh, and obviously, Philip Seymour Hoffman is amazing in it and probably the best villain of the entire series. Um, but that movie has the lowest box office of the series because of how two burned everybody. And that's really interesting to me because a lot of people say that, or I've heard. A lot of people say that three is the worst, but it's probably because they didn't see it. And the only reason people end up do seeing it is because they hear Philip Seymour Hoffman is in it. And um, that one just set the tone. For me, that one sets resets the tone for the entire franchise moving forward, because that one, obviously having the great villain and everything had a good had good thriller and like a lot of personal stakes because of, uh, you know, him having a wanting to leave that life and, you know, settle down and everything. But obviously he didn't. And uh, even though it may cause him pain, I'm glad. Um, (laughs) But uh, then after three comes my favorite and uh, what I will argue is the most entertaining and rewatchable film of the entire franchise with ghost protocol. Um, And it's, it's a lot. It has a lot that has a lot to do with the fact that it doesn't have a, like the strongest story of the series, but it has all the action beats and action set pieces that you expect from the series, but everything is up 
like everything so or that had come before uh, is kind of one up here. Um, you know, especially with the building, uh, climbing the outside of the building and everything like that. And it, it just basically took everything down to its core. And the story may have suffered a little bit, but I think that it's infinitely watchable, rewatchable. And my favorite aspect of that film is the fact that they are completely on their own. And when they do, like, obviously every movie, they and they're always threatened of that. But um, in this one, not everything, or actually everything ends up not working out the way that they initially plan. And they are always on the move trying to uh, get, like, you know, figure out a new plan in the middle of the plan. And then they end up make it, barely making it through. And it just makes it more fun. And, you know, all the banter between everybody is a lot better. And it's it just infinitely watchable for me. Uh, Rogue Nation and fallout basically are one film or one story told over two movies and both stories, you know, link together to make one really great thriller action film. And, you know, with Tom upping the ante every time it just keeps the both films just rise above all the other ones, but it's just very dense storytelling with great action set pieces to give levity. And it's just great characters. You know, the team is a great uh, ensemble cast of different characters that work really well together. And I'm super excited to see where it goes from here. Same, (laughs) except for me, I, I was very young when this franchise started. I was only two years old. So I still didn't, did not go back because it's like John Woo's um, magna opus. Like it's just big and explosive and it just has every big action scene you can put into a movie. I mean, the movie opens with Tom Cruise, you know, climbing a mountain and then getting on top of a mountain and get, you know, handed, you know, a pair of sunglasses and then those sunglasses explode after he receives them, his mission. I mean, it's just every, where it's just that extreme, the in, extreme the whole way through. So I, that's why I kind of give the second one a little bit of a new. So I, that's why I kind of give the second one a little bit of an edge because I'm like, you know, it's, that was, it was fun. Uh, uh, that wasn't already said in the first two, like it, like, yes, he cares a lot about his team. He cares about the safety of the world and he cares about the people around him. Like those are things that we kind of all picked up on in those movies. And Michelle Monaghan's character basically like, like it was kind of, even for the purpose of her being a tool um, or not, not in a tool that basically, basically, for me, I feel like third the third one really only works because of 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 Abrams, you know Abrams's di- kind of Abrams's direction, which is basically an imitation of Tony Scott uh, movies. Uh, Six one is you're just creating that environment to you know sought after like. Um, and then uh, moving and then moving on to four, I just, just don't really care for it. It's just kind of like, oh, it's just another thing that they have to do. That it, it, you know, on top of all the but other than that, it's still a fun movie. And Ghost Protocol is just no, it's no exception. I I loved I so yeah. And then Mission Impossible: Rogue Nation, I think is still the best finite, and it's and, and Rebecca Ferguson. The shoe does drop. It's completely different than what you were gonna, what you were expecting. It. Um, let's just pause for five seconds, and then I'll wrap it up. Mission Impossible Fallout, and this is after this. Yeah, I and it's still the of uh, even of the six movies because it just has. The better story and the characters, and uh, and also 
Solomon Lane is a very interesting character in that, you know, you think he is, you know, you think he is untouchable, but Ethan Hunt finds a way and it's really clever and really unique on the twist and just how everything kind of ends at the end with Solomon in Is, uh, Cruz's best performance in the series. He brings so much emotion, especially like in that that cut scene that's the the film starts with. That's midway through. It's the just cold open. yeah. It's just so much intensity and emotion, and it's just it's crazy. You feel it. It is. It's it is like it's intense watching it. Um. It's intense watching it, but it's. I wish it was in a better movie. Because it's stuff in a movie. So, Andy, what are your thoughts on the Fallout? It's good. <laughs> <laughs> it's um. It is. <laughs> it is spectacular. Um, I need to see it again. Um, I haven't got a chance to see it since in my initial viewing. Um, but. It is everything that the follow-up to uh, Rogue Nation that I wanted. Like, it it was just everything. You know, they upped the action. They brought Rebecca Ferguson back. Um, I like that they... This is the first time that they have a, a villain actually continuing into a second film, even though he's not... The, I guess he's not the, like... the. He, I guess he is, but he isn't. I don't know. He's kind of both the main villain and not, I guess. How would you describe that? Who would you say is the main villain? Because I think, obviously, for me, it's Henry Cavill, but, like, even though he's being run um, by Lane. So, I, I guess Lane is the main, you know, the big the big bad guy, and he's still alive, so obviously they're going to still be screwing around with him, and there's a lot of uh, agents still out in the world. So, like, obviously, they're going to He's basically going to be like uh, Bond's Blofeld, and uh, I can't wait for it because they their banter back and forth between each other is great. I love his voice, the way that he like talks to or he talks about how he's going to like do all this stuff. It just works for me. I don't know. It's just in the trailer and everything. Perfect trailer, by the way. But as he's explaining everything that's going to happen and everything in the trailer is just a perfect example of how maniacal and how he's always, a, he's at least he thinks he is until this movie, he thinks that he's a couple steps ahead and, you know, they flip the switch and when they find out what's actually going on. But it was just a great story, you know, great action as always. Um, I love the fact that they have Tom breaking his ankles shot in there. Um, <laughs> because like when I first saw that, I'm like, wait, I think this is the scene. And then I was looking, and I just happened to like glance at his foot, and I saw it when it was happening. I'm like, okay. I'm like, god damn it, why did I look at that? <laughs> because it looks brutal. But um, yeah, it's I don't know. Everybody's great, you know. I love uh Simon Pegg in the entire series, but he's great in here, and you know, Re- Rebecca Ferguson deserves her, like so much more than what she's getting in other franchises or other movies that she's been in, she's just not getting what she deserves because she's great. And I just wanted to see, I want to see her in everything. So yeah, it it was everything that I could have hoped for. And I can't wait for the next one. Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, I agree. I think I I can't agree. I can't disagree. It's it. I love the, She does more than just to be in the girl on the train or sides, or she, or she has to be on the side that is, you know, anonymous. It's all by writing, uh, by Macquarie, and I hope to see her more. And as far as uh, I did love Vanessa Kirby and. Did you know afterwards that she was Max's daughter from the first movie? Say that again. Sorry. She was Max's daughter from the first movie. Vanessa Redgrave's character from the first movie. I don't. Re- 
I don't remember. Wait, I don't know. Who are you referring to? Uh, the carrier in the first movie. Okay. What about her? Do you remember that character at all? No. Uh, her do- her daughter is in this movie as a okay. character. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and mm-hmm. her care. So so that little nod to the first one that was great, and even Vanessa Kirby, she really sold it as Vanessa Redgrave's daughter. She even has like a similar accent to uh, to Redgrave, so it was great. Um, and then of course, I mean, we got to talk about the action, Andy. We got to talk about it. it's the action in here. It, it feels like every scene. Has an intent. Every like few act has an intense action scene. You know, rather it be the jumping out of the the plane or the motorcycle chase or um, the the helicopter. Or four, he bought or he hi- fired his own insurance company so that he could do four. <laughs> so obviously he goes all out, but um. For me, the the obviously, I, I was kind of shocked that he didn't have a, um, a helicopter's license before this film. But like, because I figured that he would just know how or already, you know, fly helicopters and stuff. So that's pretty crazy that he would do or that he did all of that stuff. And obviously, not easy to do. But for me, the craziest stunt in this film is for sure the halo jump, because he did that jump over a hundred times and the execution on that on that shot shouldn't be possible there's a behind the scenes that you can look up where they explain all of the intricacies of that jump and of that sequence that's literally what three four minutes of the film not even Mm -hmm. and possibly they spent more time on that shot to get it right then a lot of films you like more time and money was spent on that one shot than there was for a lot of other films that were made this year because he had to do that jump over a hundred times. They had to do it at the, they can only do one jump a day that they were, while they were filming, they would do the jump multiple times a day. But when they, they had to do it, plan it out so that when they're able to film, it had to be, it had to be, the lighting had to be perfect. So it's almost like Revenant esque like that, and then when jumping out, a cameraman had a camera on his head. He couldn't see what he was shooting, and he had to do everything backwards that Tom was doing. And while they're falling two two hundred miles an hour or two hundred whatever, however fa- fast they're falling, Tom Cruise had to get within three feet of the camera in a three inch window of focus. It's just mind blowing how this even works. And they had to do this so many times and like, okay. So setting up this sh- the, to even jump is an hour process every time because they have to, they have to inhale like 15 minutes of pure oxygen. So they don't get uh, uh altitude sickness once they get up because up as high as they are, because they're getting up so high. And then they have to get to a, that height by a certain time so they can jump when the lighting is perfect. And it just blows my mind that they would even consider that. Like, honestly, I guess I'm lazy then because I would never go through all that to make that shot work. <laughs> it just blows my mind. Like all the stuff that he goes through for just to entertain. He is like the, he is the purest entertainer in Hollywood to me. And it just blows my mind. Like he learned how to hold his breath for over six minutes for rogue nation. It, it, he will literally do whatever it takes to entertain us and to make it real and authentic. And that is what makes this series the greatest running action franchise right now. And, and on top of that, he's like, 55 or 56 uh doing these stunts and it's and and you just described it all oh let's you forgot to mention when or the thing and and that's and that's in what the first 30 first 
45 minutes of this movie, that yeah. Halo jump, and it's just, yeah, it's incredible. And, and on top of that, they had to, in order to see, um, <laughs> and oh, I just learned, they just learned this yesterday. Okay, so that they know you're doing this. Yeah, because yeah, I mean, because if at, at that point, what would be the point of doing the scene of doing the scene with Tom if you couldn't see the the actual actor? So yeah, they had to see Tom literally do this entire stunt. Do no, if he if that other because you don't see his face when they're falling, right? Uh, I I don't I, think so. Maybe I think that it was just another stunt actor, just because of the the. Uh, the possibility of Tom colliding with him. Okay. Okay. Yes, but anyway, still having to do do that whole maneuver and um, they did this. They didn't do the jump over Paris. So wherever they landed, that was a pick. That was a different shot. Okay. All right. Okay. That's what I was thinking because it. Cause and also I think it it's simulated to be one shot, isn't it? If, yeah, if well, I'm remembering they just the cut it together. So yeah, they they probably just had a where they were doing it was in like I don't remember what country, but it was it wasn't even France that they were dropping that they did the Halo over. Okay. So yeah, it's and... like everything under the storm. Once they get past the storm, is probably a different jump that they did just for the landing. Mm -hmm. All right, and and, and, normal, and to like, add on, jump. well, yeah, and, and and to add on top of that, Tom Cruise had to train for a year to do that scene. Yeah, on top of having to film for multiple weeks that doing that scene. Yeah, it's crazy. So, <laughs> yeah. It, and the funny part about this movie was it still it took like ten months to film, but you but hearing that kind of stuff convinces you that yeah it took ten months to film because of the difficulty of these stunts and the difficulty of filming these scenes. Um, so so when they were just doing dialogue scenes, it it was literally just like a it was like a field day. To do to do dialogue scenes when they, you know, weren't, you know, having to do action all the time. Yeah. Great. It really is. With Henry Cavill and the other, Henry, with Henry Cavill shooting blanks, uh, simulating shooting, it's a real helicopter chase through these very narrow canyons. I bet he, I bet it did. And, and yeah, I mean, he's just hanging outside helicopter is Marvel and it just doesn't and it just pales in comparison because we're seeing the real actors doing massive stunts so yeah it just does it pales in comparison yeah um but Andy what did you think about like the story for this one because for me I feel like that was probably I wouldn't say the weakest or bad, but it doesn't hold up in terms of Rogue Nation. But what do you think about like the story and the char the story and the plot for this one? I, I liked it. I thought everything worked out really well, and it was a nice continuation of the story that was going on and the everything that they had to go through in the first one or in Rogue Nation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought story wise, I think my biggest complaint with this movie is that this I mean, look, nuclear bombs are a massive threat. But I don't but for whatever reason this movie uh it never it didn't feel as compelling as it never felt as compelling as you know it didn't feel as compelling as Four did because four, uh, we have to, so it never felt in in this one. It just was the a, a, a four doing this deal. Oh, wait, the deal isn't real. 
uh, so so for me, I fit, so for me, and that's where Mission Impossible Fallout just drops slightly below. Um, um, but for me, I felt like this was, but I still felt like it was a really good s- story, really good narrative. Um, even though you can tell at certain points that they were figuring this out as they were going along, <laughs> um, they were improvising a little bit, but still, it's a it was a fine plot uh, to hang on a bunch of really cool action set pieces. Yeah. Um, but, so, but, yeah, so let me ask you this, and then we'll kind of start, and we'll start kind of wrapping up, because we already kind of are in the spoiler territory. But, so, what do you think of Michelle Monaghan's return? It was... Like, I get why they did it, because obviously the, that would be the biggest impact and, like, hardest thing for him to deal with, and that's, like, who, she, like, he'll go, he'll bend over backwards to protect her, but, like, I don't know, it kind of was almost like a, I guess you could see it as a almost like a setup, be like, yeah, this is why he's gonna try even harder now to win. And then why would you set your? Why would you want him to try harder? You know, just the normal threat would have been enough. Where if he didn't wasn't trying harder, would he have gone and gotten in the helicopter? Would to save her and all that stuff? So like they kind of screwed themselves by doing it. Yeah, I think the. And that kind of goes with the other problem with Michelle Monaghan's character in this franchise is that she's basically used as a plot device and it never quite develops as a character. And sure, you know, Julia is a character, like she does, or Julia, she does like help Luther try and decide, you know, disarm the bomb as much as she can. But I mean, still it's like, she's not that much of a character other than what she means to hunt. She's yeah. And really in the end. Yeah. And really in the end, she basically is just there to tell hunt basically to remind him like, no, it's fine. Everything is fine because I can sleep at night because I know that you're out there stopping every threat that's going to come my way. Yeah. I know. So, so, and and for me, that's what really kind of developed. That's really the biggest development that I got out of that character is that she basically, she basically is around because Ethan will always take missions that will impact her the most. Like if if that mi- mission failed, it'll impact her the most. Got to make sure for his own life even though he's still going to be doing all this stuff to protect people oh yeah I mean there's there's no way he can move on from what he does because and there's just no way because he just of Ethan Hunt is like this is you know he goes from this character who lost his whole team in the first one and portrayed by his mentor to having to say goodbye to two different, you know, lovers and having gone through all these experiences to, you know, protect, you know, one of his own, you know, one of his own lovers. But in the end, I wish Michelle Monaghan had more to do, had more to do other than just help Luther cut wires. Yeah, but I guess because she did go through training with him, it makes sense, but... You know, she also right. has other stuff to do there. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, she was living her own life out there, but still, yeah, still. Uh, but yeah, it's a good way to close that character, and I hope, and I hope they kind of put that character to rest. You know, I hope they kind of just leave it alone because for me, I feel to mention before is that Abrams. Ever since he's been trying, and he's been allowing these filmmakers to do different stories, and all these different stories have basically given Ethan, if not if not the whole crew, just them two. Like obviously they're gonna bring Benji back, and 
everything, but like it's it's not gonna end here. I'd be shocked if it did, but we'll see in like four years, I guess. We'll see. So if there is a six, so if there is a seventh Mission Impossible, would you want Chris McQuarrie to come back? Sure. Or they can test out a different actor or a different like uh, action director, I guess. If he if he's busy, but like if Tom approves them, then I trust him. I would like to see Chris McQuarrie write the script and maybe someone else direct the seventh one because I've always loved how these movies have just been we get a different director bringing their own style. And I think McQuarrie did change up his directing style in uh, in this movie, but I feel but it still feels like a McQuarrie film to me. It still has that it feels very McQuarrie esque. So in its writing still, so I I would director and like come in and do you know do another movie. Yeah, I don't know. We'll um, see what happens. Obviously, they're gonna and like they have to write the script for the next one before they do anything anyway. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, the last two movies they had, or the last few movies they have been like writing the script as their film make. Uh, so that'll be interesting to see if they can actually finish the script yeah. to get a director. But then again, they they rewrite a lot, so who cares? So who who cares? It'll get done, and it'll be uh, on the standard, and then they'll come up with some crazy stunt that they want to do. Yep. Yep. So, do we have any more thoughts on the Mission Impossible movies and Fallout? Nope. Go see them if you haven't. Give them a chance. And nothing annoys me more than people that say that they hate Tom Cruise because he was a crazy guy like 15 years ago. People have the ability to change, and he has been on a, a tear of awesome films, like great performances for the last 10 years nonstop. Oh, Andy, don't you know people don't change? That's that's what we were supposed to take away from this whole James Gunn debacle. No one changes. They're all the same. They're they're all we're all the same terrible person. No, that's dumb. <laughs> but yeah, I yeah, I agree. Like Tom Cruise, I mean, he's really a great entertainer and he's really trying is he's really trying his damnness to make you know, he he has a good public yeah, I, I think yeah, I think we need to get off the Tom Cruise hate train. You know, I think I think we need to get back. On. Yeah, I mean, name one bad movie yeah. or what bad role he's done had since uh, Tropic Thunder. The Mummy. But is he bad in the movie? Did he not go all out to entertain? Okay, that's a good point. That movie. He's not the problem with that movie at all. Okay, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Is that, yeah, I mean, he's doing good. He's doing good work in The Mummy. Or he's inexplicably underrated. Yeah, I, even Oblivion, it's like, no, Tom Cruise is still trying in that movie. It's just, the problem with Oblivion is that it kind of, it, it's, it kind of at times lull you to sleep. No. That's the no. problem with Oblivion. The problem with Oblivion is that not enough people give it a shot to watch it because it is absolutely gorgeous. Watch it in 4K if you can. And uh, while it is not original, and that's my initial issue with it, is that is, is its unoriginality, but his enthusiasm and the direction and the how it looks make it all worth it yeah i i like joseph kinzinski's movies for the style uh even that granite mountain movie he did was really good like it was a, actually really it actually gave me a little hope for top gun 2 so like i have faith but i'm just saying we'll see how it goes 
We'll see. We'll see if we'll see. I mean, we know Tom Cruise can do the action scenes. Um, cause we we know he can do it. So yeah, we'll see what we'll see what that is. But we'll we'll see what that is next summer. Yep. Um. It's still a really good movie to watch. Definitely. Do it. Don't be biased and say that you hate Tom Cruise when you haven't seen a movie of his in 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, and Tom Cruise is actually doing a lot of really good work lately. I mean, yeah, the mummy movie, it's terrible. It's, it's not good, but he's not the worst thing in it. No, definitely not. Um, yeah. Oh well. It, it, yeah. Can't wait to see what he does next. Uh, Top Gun Maverick. That's the next one. Yeah. I'm excited to see it. Um. Yeah. I still hope one day they do that live, die, repeat, and repeat movie again or movie. That's such a stupid name. I still hope. What else would you call it? <laughs> it needs to be called "All You Need That's... Is Kill." All you need is kill too. That's all it needs to be called. All you need is kill. Yeah, thanks Warner Brothers for overcomplicating the title of your really good sci-fi movie. For some reason, they had no idea what to do with that, and it blows my mind. But it's Warner Brothers, so they they screw up everything. Unless it's like Harry Potter, where it just lays itself out, they have no idea what to do with anything. Or Christopher Nolan, or... um, even Clint Eastwood's a not really a good filmmaker, but they kind of let him be what he let him do what he wants. Um, yeah, you're right. Harry Potter is the only one that's like semi okay, and even that, I still don't care. I kind of just don't care. I'm still not interested in the crimes of Grindelwald. No, not at all. Since my audio cut out for this segment, uh. You can find Andy and send all the good tweets to him at Talking Can. And you can also follow me on Twitter at MovieKale and follow the channel uh, at KHC Network. And you can also follow the show uh, for updates at KHC Network. Thank you so much for listening this week. And we'll be back with you next week for Christopher Robin. You both know you need them. Stuck in the middle. You don't understand what you're involved in. You need to walk away. Please don't make me go through you. How many times has Hunt's government betrayed him, disavowed him, cast him aside? How long before a man like that has had enough? Ethan, that's not who we are. Maybe we need to reconsider that. So, how is he? Oh, you know, same old Ethan. I find it best not to look. <laughs>